Okay, welcome guys. My name is John Mark Dyer, and this is the YWAM Conan podcast. Conversations about the missions movement for young people. So I'm here with Dr. Michael Brown, and I don't, can I read through your uh, biography that's on your website? Is this, Whatever you like. I think it'll give people, uh, it's very eye-opening. Um, so you became a believer in uh, 1971. Heroin shooting, LSD using, <laughs> long-haired Jewish hippie rock drummer. Yes, sir. That's what it says. It's all true. I love that. It's all true. Uh, and then it says, since then, he's preached throughout America and around the world, bringing the message of repentance, revival, reformation, and cultural revolution. Gospel-based moral That's and pretty cultural epic. revolution. Yes, sir. And you got a PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Literature from New York University. Yes. I think my grandpa got his PhD from that same uh, university. What field? It was in missions, mission missiology. Fascinating. From yeah. NYU. Wow, mm -hmm. I didn't know they had that. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I couldn't tell you. I looked at his dissertation once, and it was about short-term teams in the missions movement. And, uh, and then you serve as an adjunct professor for, I counted, seven universities. Yeah, it's up to eight now. Adjunct okay. visiting prof at, at eight different schools. Not obviously at the same time, but over the years. Okay. I have been privileged to do that. I love that. And... Uh, and then contributed to articles and scholarly publications, including the Oxford Dictionary. The Jewish religion. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, was so, really curious. What, what was the contribution to the dictionary? Okay, so I'm a Jewish believer in Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. So you would think by default I would not be writing for the Oxford Dictionary of Jewish religion. Uh, but what happened was they, uh, they needed articles on minor Talmudic rabbis, so not the famous rabbis that are in the Talmud, but more minor ones. Okay. And the problem was that the, the, the big top name Jewish scholars in that field either didn't want to write on the more minor figures or they're already booked out. Uh, so I was approached to do it, and I said to the editors I was dealing with, well, you need to tell the senior, senior editor that I'm a Messianic Jew. <laughs> So my academic credentials were great, but he said, well, you're not writing on Paul or Jesus. That's right. So I said, well, let's, let's do all 28 then. I'll just take them on. Wow. Uh, and then, yeah, other, so there's the academic side of me, which came about because as a Jewish believer, uh, I was challenged instantly by the rabbis. So I had yeah. no background. I was not academic. I hadn't read the Bible. I was just brand new coming out of rebellion and drug culture and all of that. But the challenge made me realize, okay, I have to learn. So that's when I started taking Hebrew classes in college and then ended up getting my master's and PhD in Semitic languages. Wow. So I've written for other major theological dictionaries and, and Semitic journals and those kinds of things as, as part of the academic work. But since I know ultimately we're going to talk about revival, I can just jump in. Yeah. I got radically wonderfully saved uh, in 71, started preaching. At, at, at the age of 18 in 1973, spent hours and hours with God every day, just passionate, burning with fire for the Lord. By the time I was, I was doing my PhD work, I had left my first love. In wow. my mind, I had grown in wisdom. I was just more mature. And there, I'm sure there was some wisdom and maturity, but really, even though I was a committed believer and active and our family took in refugees and cared for the poor and did all that, even so... And I was known for my Christian witness at, at, at NYU. So I was an unashamed believer, but I had left my first love. That early passion, intimacy, devotion wasn't there. Hmm. So I, I laid scholarship on the altar before the Lord, and God really burned it up in terms of it had become an idol Wow! and gave it back as a tool. So it remains a tool for what I, I do, but the the bulk of my ongoing ministry is, is more on the practical level, more in the revival fire outreach, change the world kind of thing, okay. undergirded by scholarship. So I've written commentaries on Jeremiah and Job and working on Isaiah commentary now. I'm part of a massive project that will be a massive Jewish outreach tool. I'm involved in Jewish apologetics, written many volumes on that. But on a day-to-day -day level, what I'm seeking to do is, is, is spark people, stir hearts. Yeah. My daily radio show, the articles I write to, to bring awakening in the church out of which we'll see change in the world around us. Okay. This, okay, this is fascinating. This this is going to fit so well because you know, our a lot of the students that we get here, 
they have that six month experience in our discipleship training schools. And then they have to go, you know, I, I'll say real world. <laughs> they have to go out in the world. And so many of them talk about this experience of just, it's such a, a, a you know, a radical change, you know, the, the biblical conversations, what it looks like, you know, they, they have their a community here that's full of young people, lots of fire, always inspiration. And now to maintain that uh, and live it out in a different environment, what, what would you say to that young person who's had, you know, a highly emotional, you know, full of vision, a lot of that initial experience, but now is living it out and trying in that same like wrestle? Yeah, so we've had to deal with this similarly in our ministry schools over the years, so because I've taught at or led ministry schools on and off for the last 40 years, the better part of the last 40 wow. years. And uh, we raised up a, a ministry school in the midst of the Brownsville Revival. Of, so the revival was 95 to 2000 with absolute intensity beyond what you can imagine. Now we raise up a school in the midst of it with everyone wanting to give their lives for the Lord. So you get the most committed of the committed. So now mm -hmm. you have a bubble within a bubble, okay. right? The, the revival bubble of this unbelievable move of God that you're seeing things happen day and night that you've dreamed about and prayed for and fasted for for years. It's happening in front of your eyes. Now a school of ministry, not just young people, because people leaving their jobs, careers, just so touched yeah. in revival, want to give their lives. So now you have that intensity within it, and it's glorious and it's wonderful, and you want to drink in everything you can, but it's not the real world. Okay, it's, yeah. It's not living life out there. So the first thing that, that I would say to every young person that will come into this environment and go through the DTS is drink in everything you can while you're there because it's a unique environment yeah. where you're required to be praying or you're required to be fasting or you're required to do outreach. Most of life's not going to be like that. You're going right. to have to fight for your time with God. You're going to have to go against the grain to do outreach. But don't, don't demean it because it's, it's not the real world. Drink it in. Take advantage of it. Mm. Get as much time as you, as you can. Maximize it. I know for me, I'm always thinking about the next thing. And, and God's had to remind me for many years to, to focus on now. Wherever I am, as Jim Elliott said, wherever you are, be present. Mm -hmm. So rather than think what's going to happen out of here, no, no. Drink in everything you can. Maximize the experience. So maximize the experience within the bubble. Okay, right? I, love, I love that. Almost look at it like you, you got to hold your breath before swimming underwater for a while. So pack in as much as you can yeah. in your lungs. So by the time I was saved a year, I, uh, I was spending at least six or seven hours alone with God every day. Wow. Now here's what happened. I get radically saved, instantly set free from drugs, you know, now going through the sanctification process, you know, the early stages. And following the Lord, going to church multiple times a week with my friends, but still had a lot of free time. I had a light high school schedule, a right. lot of free time. And, and I said to myself one day, I could lead a clean but empty life, or I could give myself to God the way I gave myself to drugs and rock music. So I just grabbed every hour I could. I'm sure I got a little legalistic with myself, but it was, for the most part, beautiful and wonderful. So by the time I was saved a year... I would spend at least six or seven hours alone with God. And remember, this is before cell phones and PCs and tablets and cable TV. So, I mean, I was undistracted. Yeah. Uh, not a phone call, nothing. Just but, reading your Bible, so worship, was, prayer. So what it would be, I'd, I'd always pray in tongues at least an hour a day. That I'd do okay. it like, late at night. But at least two hours of prayer in general. So three hours or more in prayer every day. I would read the Bible two hours a day without fail. And then memorize scripture one hour a day. I used to memorize 20 verses a day. My mind that had been so fried from drugs was just sharp, alert. Did that without missing a day for six months. And then wow. started working a summer job before going to college. And now my whole schedule changed. And now I had, you know, less than half that time at best every day. Yeah. But I remember during that time, the reason I bring it up was I remember at one point spending all these hours with the Lord. And I said to myself, you know, I maybe I should be out evangelizing more because I was witness to one new person a day and did outreach one or two days a week. But I thought, maybe this is selfish. And I thought, no, no, this is like John the Baptist in the wilderness. I just had that thought. This is laying foundations. 
I didn't realize I'd never have that much time again wow. yeah. in that way. So to this day, obviously I've been in the Word all these decades and teaching the Word and preaching the Word, but that's where the foundation was laid to this day. That's why I can with confidence get up at any moment with God's anointing and teach on any subject that he drops in my heart because the foundations were laid back then, reading through the whole Bible cover to cover five times in those days. Um, many folks that are into academics will know the name Craig Keener, uh, one of the world's foremost New Testament scholars. Okay. He's a brilliant kid, you know, reading Greek philosophy and all this as a teenager, becomes an atheist because the smart people are atheists, and obviously he wants to be enlightened, and he has a radical conversion experience about, about the same age I was, maybe a little bit younger. But now realize as well, all these people that grew up in church, they have a head start. I need to really le learn the word. So he just starts digging in and realizes if he read 40 chapters a day, he could read the <laughs> New Testament in a week and the whole Bible in a month. So he that. did that over and over and over for many, many months. So here I am memorizing 20 verses a day. Here he is reading 40 chapters a day. Wow. But that became the foundation yeah. for the rest of his life so look at it like this. It's a unique opportunity to, to lay those deeper roots down and to spend time praying about the rest of your life. Okay. To spend time really crying out, Lord, I don't want to blow it when I get it. I don't just want to go back to being secular. I, I, I don't want to forget everything I learned here. So make a serious investment yeah. of your time, of your energy to take in everything you can. Look at it like... You ever see these old shopping spree things? You have one hour going through yeah. a store to get, like, grab everything you can, but in a focused way, not random, trying to get, like, 40 different subjects mastered, but go deeper, Yeah, go deeper, go deeper, because it's not going to be like this when you get out of here. So you're, you're saying for these people in their 20s, they have this unique season where they are undistracted, they have the time, and they need to run as hard as they can take in as much as they can, whatever their capacity is, try to push it to the limit because that's laying the foundation for the rest of their life in God. Yeah, yeah. This is this is a unique season, probably not to be repeated. Yeah. So recognize it coming in. And then when you leave, rather than comparing your life to this and feeling condemned, because I went through that for a little while. That's part of what got me more into scholarship because I felt I'm not spending as many hours. Now I'm in college. Now I'm married. I'm and, and it weighed on me. It's the only season of my life where I, I dealt with any sense of condemnation because I, I otherwise never do. But that, I didn't recognize the love of the Father as much because I was trying to do more and because I wasn't doing enough. Mm -hmm. There he wasn't so pleased with me. This is something self-imposed. So grab this, and then when you're out of here, what you have to do, your number one challenge for the rest of your life is going to be your daily time with God. Quality, relationship with God, intimacy with God in the word and prayer. Yeah. And you have to jealously make the main thing the main thing. You have to prune off secondary things that get in the way. You may love reading theology, but it takes you away from the word. Mm -hmm. Be in the word first. You, you, you may love you know, other subjects that are fascinating. Meet with God first. And especially if you get called into vocational ministry where you don't work a nine-to-five job, and if you succeed at it, that will become your great challenge, keeping wow. your roots deep with God. The more successful you are in ministry, the harder it is to do this because the pulls are constant, and you feel like you're doing God's work all the time. But that great, strong tree that endures a terrible storm does it because of the strength of the roots, and the roots are hidden. Wow. Roots are unseen. Ministry is just the public extension of who you are in private. So the, the question to ask yourselves is, how deep am I? Yeah. And everything flows out of that intimate relationship with God. So do you, have, do you have periods in your life where you've looked and there's been warning signs like, hey, I am distracted? Because I, I would imagine most people, you know, it takes effort and work to really do the deep work and connect with the Lord. And just we have that natural bent to kind of take things easy, kind of let off a little bit. How, you know, have, how did you make sure you kept 
that zeal alive. And so you kept going after the Lord and, and going deep with fervor. So I've had to keep vigilant okay. to this day because my tendency, my weakness is not laziness. My weakness is overwork. Okay. My weakness is running so hard to accept so many invitations to do so many things for the Lord that I get so busy with the work of the Lord that I neglect the Lord himself. I neglect the Lord of the work. Right. Uh, and I've had to repent of that many a time that, you know, that God's enabled me to produce a lot. Uh, you know, written over 40 books, written over 2,500 articles, do a daily radio show five days a week live, and then teach at schools and travel and preach. And I thrive in the midst of it. I'm not burnt out. I'm not tired. I'm not feeling depleted. But it's, there's an arrogance to that. It's as if mm -hmm. I, can, I can make it mm -hmm. on my own, or I could make it just on the anointing. And because there's a spiritual adrenaline that yeah. you get doing the work and seeing the fruit, that again, it's it's something I have to constantly remind myself about. Uh, work with my team. It's like I overcommit it. Please don't let me overcommit next time. Because like, hey, could you help here? Of course, I want to help. Mm -hmm. A grad here. Could you, of course, I want to help. You know, yeah. can you do? Can you write this? You bet. It's done. You know. So there's it, it's it's sinful though to step outside yeah. of of that foundation. And like what I've done in recent years. To, to guarantee that my tendency is going in the other direction of being with him more, doing less, being more, right? Mm -hmm. Is that uh, once a month, it's on average, once a month, uh, I, instead of traveling out, that I just do a prayer retreat. It could mm -hmm. either be a little hotel suite nearby, it could be a little cabin, just some simple yeah. thing where I'm alone. And so I finish my radio show on a Friday, I go to the store, I get my salad stuff, and, and head over it to the place where I'm going to stay. So it's all Friday night, Saturday day, Saturday night, Sunday day, Sunday night, check out Monday, just to be with God. Wow. I do very, very little writing. Doesn't matter what projects I'm involved with, very, very little writing. I do read the Word, maybe a snippet of a Christian book here and there, but otherwise the time is spent praying. Whoa. Seeking God, being with God, laying things out, hearing His voice. And, and I find when I do that, so that's going on two years now, hmm. doing those prayer retreats, it helps me get my bearings back. Yeah, It helps me get the larger perspective of what matters. It helps me to see if I've gotten frenzied in my activity. And then the biggest thing is I'm with God. I'm, I'm in his presence. Mm -hmm. You're changed in his presence. And then he moves on me to intercede. And because and I journal very, very assiduously, I have for many years, so I've, I've reviewed the things he's moved on me to pray of these prayer retreats, and I'm stunned to see the fruit that's come mm. out of them. And when I was talking to my wife, Nancy, about this, I'd done an eight-day prayer retreat in December of 2020. I hadn't done one that long in many years. Stopped everything, got along with God. And, and um, I came back and I said, you know, on weekends when I'm home, unless you need me helping out around the house or the yard, uh, I'm just not going to leave the room. Until I until I get where I need to get in God, and I said, Whoa. and I said, I think once a month, uh, once a quarter, I should do a three a three day prayer retreat. She said to me, No, you got to do it once a month. She said, You'll never get where you need to be in God if you just do it once a quarter. <laughs> so that was like, you're you're right, you're right. So my so that's my whole story, right? Yeah. But for everyone has to recognize their own tendency, and then actively work against it because otherwise it's always going to go in a certain direction it's just inevitable you know it's like you put a boat in the water and just sit it there and the tide's going one way that's the way the boat's going right. to go so i see the tendencies the lifelong tendencies that i have so i have to consciously work against them for some it means you start your day even if it's a half hour you're going to start your day meeting with god in the quality way Mm. Are you going to make sure, okay, I take one night a week where I don't do anything else. I don't answer the phone I and I just seek God. Mm. But something to, to lock things in because otherwise most of us, I know some just want to pray all day and, and they don't want to do anything outside of that. But most are not like that. 
And because prayer is the most spiritual work and being in the Word is the most spiritual work, it's infinitely easier to talk to another person or to read another book right, totally. as opposed to meeting with God and being in the Word. So you just have to realize, okay, my lifelong priority has to be to keep the main thing the main thing. Yeah. First things first. And, and just think of it, you got a long ride, long car ride, you're late, but you've got no gas. Unless you stop and get the gas, you're going to die on the side of the road. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. What are, I mean, have you noticed different warning signs like, hey, the oil in my lamp is a little bit low? Like, are there things where if you could talk to people out in the world or on the missions field and saying, if you start noticing these things, that's a clue, like you, your intimacy with Jesus is Yeah, dry. Now it's going to be different for everybody. For some, they'll realize they're getting a little short-tempered. Mm -hmm. They're just a little bothered. They're just not gracious. Yeah. Uh, for, for others, they'll, they'll just start to feel weight on them, like, man, something's not right. You know, sometimes that, that, that'll be it's like, something's, not, something's just not right. It's like, you just need to stop, get yeah. with God. Uh, some, it, you know, you start to feel like this cloud coming on you. Uh, for others, there's just no vision. You, you, you feel dry. And, and uh, for others, it's as simple as, okay, I keep finding reasons to, to pray second or to, yeah. to do this second. Uh, or I'm, I'm not getting burdened the way you get burdened. I remember mm. because so much of my times with God have been late at night, you know, hours and hours, which the better pattern is first thing in the day. But my pattern for decades has been really meeting with God and doing a lot of writing late at night. Yeah. So let's say in the morning I wake up with a distinct burden. Stop what you're doing and pray. To my shame, it's happened a number of times. Where I said, yeah, absolutely, I just want to answer this one email. And then I'm out. Well, oh, that one email, oh, I got to respond to this. And then it's midnight, so I realize I didn't even pray. And there's been no burden the whole day. Whereas yeah. when I do go with it, the next day it's stronger. Mm -hmm. So it's like, wow, that burden's not there. Or the, you know, if you just look at the tendencies that indicate something superficial, something in the flesh. Telltale signs. Uh, sometimes it's a spouse. But we'll see it. I, I remember the pastor of our church. I haven't thought of this for decades, probably, but it just comes to mind. Where I was say, saying that this famous concert pianist or violinist said, uh, if I don't practice for a day, uh, I know it. If I don't practice for two days, my colleagues know it. If I don't practice for three days, my audience knows it. And we're talking about prayer. Yeah. You know, so yet when you're just not yourself and when the vision's not there, the passion's not there, you try, you're running on fumes. The, some, you know, and it's not a matter of opposition. We all experience opposition and go through challenging times. Yeah. It's just I'm, I'm getting carnal. I'm getting in the flesh. I am yeah. not flowing with God. Yeah. Tell me, tell me about what is the role of, of kind of a, your vision, your calling play in kind of the fuel to that intimacy. I mean, I, I know you can't, you don't want all your personal time with Jesus to be about your assignment and your calling, but there is an element like, no, God has a real calling and assignment for my life. It, tell me about how that's played out in your life. So that's the strength and a weakness. Yeah. A strength is I'm driven by it 24 seven. I'm carried by it 24 seven. The, the vision of what God's called me to do for his glory and the effect it's supposed to have has zero to do with ambition or wanting to be known yeah. or somebody. Uh, God knows how to burn that out and humble us over the years, I can assure you. <laughs> he knows how to put us through the fire. But I'm consumed by it. I, I'm moved by it. Uh, it stirs me constantly. Uh, th and because of that, I have to be with him because everything I need is found in him. And I can't tell you how many times over the years I've said, Lord, I just want to be with you, enjoy your presence, and love you, and not ask you for anything. And next thing, literally, within seconds, I am on my face groaning and travailing for something, and, and God birthed it. I, wow. I didn't come in with that agenda. Uh, there'll be times like, Lord, I just want to worship you and encounter you, and next thing, fire! Fire of God's grip me, praying for revival, fire. It's like, well, Lord, I, I was just here to worship you, but you dropped this thing in me. 
Yeah. Or the prophetic burden, you know, the nation's collapsing. What are we going to do? And so the encounter with God further fuels the fire of the calling in ways that are so intense sometimes I find it hard to express because it is so deep and so gripping and so overwhelming. Yeah. At the same time, I always have to be careful to not let the calling and burden become a thing in itself. It, it always has to loop me back to intimacy with the Lord. And that's what happens in these prayer retreats. I'll have these times of agonized travail for the fulfillment of God's, something God's called me to do. But then just enough time in his presence, <laughs> Jesus, I love you. Lord, I love you. You're amazing. Just weeping before him because he's so good. So everything ultimately has to come back to then, to that. And those of us who are more driven or whatever the, you know, whatever survey you want type of personality, yeah, right, that we just take this thing and run with it and visionary and all of that, we have to be careful yeah. that everything flows out of intimacy and everything ends with intimacy. Yeah. So even reading the word, okay, it's one thing to read this and grip and I'm going to write on this. It's another thing to say, Lord, just speak to me. I just, just want to drink in, take in what you have. So hopefully it's like a circle. It's like a loop. Yeah. And, 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 it, and, and intimacy with God further fuels the fire of the calling. The fire of the calling drives you on your face to meet with God. And it goes like that. Yeah. So the calling can never be separated from the relationship. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, as I, I'm trying to remember who, who said this, I believe Leonard Ravenhill quoted it in one of his early revival books, but it was that love for souls is not the great qualification of a missionary, but love for Christ. Wow. So the love for souls comes out of a love for Christ. Right. And, and ultimately, that's the only thing that's going to carry us through long term. Yeah. So what would you what would you say to, you know, the students that go home and I mean, we really believe everyone has a missional calling, whether it's, you know, some people God's going to ask to go to the nation, some people it's their neighborhood back home. Um, but the ones that are kind of like, I, I don't know, I don't have that real sense of calling or assignment right now. Um, maybe they've had flashes of it, you know, in a, in a school, but they're like, I don't, I lost the bread comes. I don't know how to get there. Um, God spoke to a nation, but it seems like spoke to me about a nation, but it seems like right now, I don't know what to do with that. What do you say? Like, how did, how did you go from those early years where it was six hours with the Lord to, Oh, he's given me an assignment. I know what my purpose is. How did he transition you? And what would you say to the young people that are looking for that? Right. So first and foremost, find your identity in being a son or daughter of God. Not in having a gift of healing, not in having a gift of preaching, singing, not in anything else, not in being called to Malaysia, not in being yeah. called to politics. First and foremost, find your identity as a child of God. And that if he's pleased with you, all is good. Right? So, so you can be fulfilled alone in prayer. You can be fulfilled worshiping on a mountain. You can be fulfilled dying as a martyr mm -hmm. be because your identity is found in him. And it's not going to be based on what you're doing. Because otherwise, we like, I'm just in a holding pattern now. Or, well, no, no, you're in a growing pattern. You're in a training yeah. pattern. Uh, so that's one thing. Find your identity in him. Second thing is make the most of every opportunity. You're in a bad setting. Don't wish for it to end quick. Maximize it. Learn what you can from it. Learn to humble yourself. Learn perseverance. Wow. Uh, thank God for now. That's even a lesson I've worked on in recent years because it's so easy for Gosh, me to be good. on to the next thing is wherever I am, even the, the things I don't like, I start to say, thank you, God, for now. Thank you, God, for now. And because all we live in is now. Yeah. So maximize that. Gosh, uh, during the good. Brownsville days, pastors would, would get our students going into the third year as interns, and they would contact me and they say, Dr. Brown, what do I do? I made a three-month commitment to be here. The pastors thought just having me on staff we bring revival. They got me in like a back room, you know, filing stuff. And they, <laughs> they, what do I do? I said, crucify the flesh. Humble yourself. Take advantage of this opportunity to get low. Yeah. And hopefully you'll never be in this again. Yeah. And what you want to do is, is not have God look at you and say, okay, they can't hack this. I'm going to pull them out. 
because what that is, is you're going to go back to that class again. It's a test. What I want to do is pass that test so yeah. I get promoted to the next grade. Wow. <laughs> so wherever you find yourself, that's, that's so your good. now. Yeah. Okay, maybe you are called to preach to millions, but you're asked to, to minister to three-year-olds. That's your now. Grab that. Remember the Luke 16 principles, faithful and little, faithful and much, right? Faithful in that which belongs to someone else, faithful in that which is yours, faithful with natural resources, faithful with spiritual resources. So don't glorify tomorrow, right? It's, it's obedience today. Yeah. So you find your identity in the Lord right now, first thing. Second thing, seize the moment, be obedient in the moment, be honoring. You, know, you, you have your own call, honor the person that's over you. You want people to honor you when, you have, when you're the leader? You honor them. Just right. sow good seeds today for tomorrow. And then uh, pray into your calling. Every one of us, is, with rare exception, but I don't know any exceptions firsthand. I'm sure they must exist. But almost always, you get gripped with the call, you see the reality of it, and then the, the screen lifts. It's like, I had such a burden for it, but it's not here yet. What? Well, if it was there in front of us, that's all we'd be thinking about. And it might be five or 10 or 20 years down the line. And you say, well, who can wait that long? Well, don't you want your life to be going uphill rather than downhill? Wow. Isn't it better that each year that goes by, the calling is richer and more beautiful as opposed to when you're 20, you've hit your apex? Right. Right? So it means that the big things, the really good things, the really major things, are going to take time. Otherwise, they're useless. Gosh, that's so if, good. If they're here, do they go on tomorrow? They're, they're useless. It's like the gestation period of a mouse is like three weeks. And then it's, you know, if it survives the snakes, the cats, the poison, it lives, well, maybe two years. Yeah. It's still this miserable little tiny thing. Whereas this gestation period of an elephant is like 22 months. And then gives birth to like a 600 pound calf that hits the ground walking and is going to live to be 80 and has no natural predators. So I I don't, I don't want, I don't want micro mouse or mini mouse ministries. No. So the good things are going to take time. Look, if God shows you, you're a young woman. And God shows you, you come from a big family, you're going to have 10 kids, and your kids are all going to be doctors, lawyers, or missionaries, all loving Jesus. Well, it's going to take decades to come to pass, Yeah. right? Yep. Just everything going well, it's going to take decades to come to pass. But here's the deal. Today is important. You led someone to Jesus today, that's important. You encountered the Lord in prayer, that's important. Wow. You, you showed love to a hurting person, that's important. No, maybe it's not on TV like you'll be one day, or maybe it's not like you know, 20 million social media followers one day, but every day is important. So I'm going to seize that moment, but then it's like all oh, the calling, the burden. So every major thing God's called me to do, I got the first grip of it, and then there was a long delay. Wow. And during yeah. that long delay, I questioned whether it was really God. Did I really hear God? Did I exaggerate? There's an amazing verse in Psalm 105 about Joseph. So this famine in Canaan, it, God, it says he sent, God sent a man into Egypt. Joseph sold as a slave. So they put his feet in shackles, his, necks, his neck, you know, in a yoke and all that. And, and it says, and, until what he foretold came to pass. And the right translation of the Hebrew is, the word of the Lord tested him. In other words, the very promises God gave him wow. as a teenager tested him in jail. Oh, Joseph, I thought you were going to be the big man. Oh, I thought your brothers and mother and father were going to bow down to you. You're going to die a prisoner in Egypt. So you think, okay, I wasn't God. I I made it all up. But then it keeps coming up in your heart. It's like, okay, I exaggerated. He showed me a little. I made it into a lot. But then why does he keep burdening me to pray? It's like, no, it was the Lord, but I, I wasn't praying enough then, so I missed the opportunity. Or it was the Lord, but remember I blew it. I sinned, so God closed the door. I've been through each of those things. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about like one of your experiences through that. Uh, so, I give you an older one. In April of '83, God spoke to me that I'd be used in a revival that would touch the whole world. Mm. It seemed utterly crazy then. I was unknown. I'd just been excommunicated from my church. How old were you at this? So, so 1983. I had just turned 28. Okay. Finished up my PhD. The, uh, this is 
right after I'd left my first love, you know, God oh, restored, yeah. sent the fire through me. The church rejected the fire. Pastor came to me in tears many years later, confessing, you know, he blew it. But anyway, God moves on me. I can't shake it. It deepens over the months. Uh, I see God move powerfully, but I, I know he's going to fulfill this. Uh, he connects me with Leonard Ravenhill, author of Our Revival Tarries, connects me with David Wilkerson. I'm minister. You know, it's like, okay, getting closer. We're going to see the fire fall. There's going to be a revival. I'm in that touches the world. And then, like, everything kind of stopped. And I wasn't preaching for David Wilkerson anymore. Hmm. And Brother Len's gone to be with the Lord. And I'm hearing reports of God moving here and God moving there. And but didn't you promise? Maybe I exaggerated. I yeah. went through all those yeah, different yeah. things. And then next thing, I'm on the front lines of the revival in Pensacola and everything we dreamed about. When I was a new believer, I, I out of the blue one day, I just wrote down a couple of paragraphs about faith. I was so proud of them. I showed them to my dad who wasn't a believer in that. I showed them to him and uh, showed them to my pastor. And he said, maybe you're called to write. And mm. was, that was like a, not anything we thought of then. You're called to preach, either yeah. an evangelist or a pastor. Those were like our paradigms, you know? Uh, and I thought, yeah, I am. I am called to. And when I do like an essay in college class, it'd say, well, you write really well, etc. But I, I feel, I start preaching now. I preach with fire, passion. Everything flows right out of me. I go to write, it's like, get stuck and hmm. it becomes technical and much more academic. You know when the release finally came? 17 years later. And wow. Boom, it exploded. I mean, huh. it exploded to the point of dozens and dozens of books and, you know, writing a book in as little as eight days and just uh, to cow. this moment, it pours out of me. Right before coming here, I had a few minutes. I'm just sitting, working on another book. And I'm glad in retrospect that the floodgates didn't open earlier. Because to start yeah. writing what I was writing, the way I was writing it, I was 34 at that time, I was more ready than yeah. I was in years before that. And I'd been through a lot more purging. There are other things, you know, major, major things God's spoken to me that only in recent months have I seen the, the beginning of the answer. This is after contending for things for over 20 years. Wow. And over the course of time, you think, well, you missed yeah. your opportunity. You know, so it, it can happen to any of us. So but, how, did, how did you hang on to the, the promise all while maybe dealing with the confusion or disappointment? How did you keep your heart tender in it so you didn't like, I mean, maybe you did turn your back and be like, ah, that's not going to happen or. Well, it, it wasn't even keeping my heart tender. It's just when I'd really meet with God, it would burn again. Okay. Like I'd rationalize, okay, you're you exaggerated, <laughs> you know, you're. Or you blew it, you, you know, so God passed you by, or, yeah, come on, you weren't praying and fasting enough, etc. But then it would rise in me again. So if God keeps burning the thing, bringing it up, then obviously he's saying, no, you have heard me. Wow. And, and a, a couple of years ago, I was on a prayer retreat, and I just, uh, 23 months ago, I remember it was May 2021, because I was looking at my journal again, checking some dates, and, I, and so we've been blessed by God's grace, reached millions of people, trained thousands of people, got a great voice, great influence, by, all, all by God's grace, zero to do with me, all to do with him. But there are all these other promises haven't happened yet. So I was talking to the Lord. I'm 68 now, uh, so 66 then. Feel great, healthy, thriving, but I said, all right, Lord, I, I just want to be realistic here. These things that you promised me should have happened by now. I mean, let's just be realistic. So I don't want to do that. I'm good. I'm great. I'm blessed. I'm thrilled beyond words by what we've seen so far. But I, you know, I don't want to deceive myself. And I heard the Lord say to me quietly, where's your faith? Wow. I said, well, no. But see, that's the whole thing. Because if I knew that I knew, if I was sure, then I would believe. I, you know, but <laughs> right. it's because I'm not sure. And then I hear that voice again. Didn't I do everything else I promised you? Yeah, but it's different now because I'm older. So we're, you know, you could go through this at the age of 18 or at the age of 88 because it, it's all in the mind. It's, yeah. it's all up here. And it's just, okay, did I do the other things? Yes. Is the promise still burning? Yes. Well, then don't care about time. Yeah. I mean, look, we know, especially these days, that you could go from obscurity to the whole world knowing your name in 30 seconds. It, it, a video could be released. A set, you know, next thing, boom. So God's reminding me, do I not have the power to do that if I want to? Hmm. All, here's, here's what I can guarantee everybody. 
All you need to be is in right relationship with God, right relationship with him, and to the best of your knowledge, walking in obedience to his will. Everything else will fall into place. You're supposed to meet a king. You're supposed to meet a media producer. You're supposed to uh, meet a politician. You're supposed to meet your spouse. You're su- He'll take care of everything. He's God. He really is God. Uh, the, I remember, uh, I'm not one that has a, a ministry at this point in my life anyway, to like kings and rulers and major political leaders. You know, I've had some political interaction, but it's not, I've never sensed that was a main calling. I'm not one of these guys in the White House meeting with the yeah. president, that kind of thing. So uh, a, a very anointed uh, prayer warrior evangelist uh, sister that worked uh, with Reinhard Bonnke for years, Suzette Hatting, she's there visiting in Brownsville, somewhere I think in 1998. It's all journal. And she has a word over me, and you'll meet with princes. And I thought, it's interesting. Like two weeks after that, I'm having a private meeting with Prince Andrew in Buckingham Palace. Wow. So I mean, where'd that come from? How'd that happen? I went to England with that not even being on my mind at, at all, any more than I'd be asked to be the next king. You know what I'm saying? It just was not in my thinking <laughs> right. at all. And it, it, to me, it was just God saying, I can do that kind of thing if I want to. Holy I've, cow. I remember walking down the street of New York City. Um, getting ready to debate a rabbi there in New York. And I hear the Lord say to me, I want you on secular media more. I want you on secular TV more. I get home and I get a call. Living in Pensacola, Florida, I get a call. Hi, this is Bobby Grossman. I work with Phil Donahue. So he was a pioneer talk guy, been off for a while, but he'd come back. So he was, he was a famous name, come back for a year. Yeah, I, I work with Donahue. Uh, we'd like you to have, have you on as a guest to talk about uh, who goes to heaven and who goes to hell? And do Jews need Jesus? I thought it's obviously a prank call, yeah. <laughs> you know, especially the subject matter, right? But it was real. Wow. Like, you know, crazy things like that. God says it. The next thing I get this call, and the call came through the most unlikely connection. I mean, those are tiny examples, but I, I'm an eyewitness to it. Within YWAM, everyone knows the Lauren Cunningham stories, I'm sure, and they have yeah. a lot of their own stories. All you need to be is in right relationship with God. Yeah. Deep personal devotion and walking in obedience. Everything else, funding, connections, everything else will take care of itself. Yeah. Gosh, I love it. I, the simplicity of that, I, I really like. Um, what, when you look at, our generation right now and, and what the, what we need, how, how would you call young people right now to prepare themselves? If they do have that six hours a day, like you did, and they have the, their life in front of them, what are you seeing in the world that you're like, Hey, if you want to prepare for the calling that God has to walk worthy of it, what do you, what do you challenge them to do? Yeah. So it's a unique set of challenges that they've been raised with. Uh, much harder than when, than when I was younger. Uh, and to this day, it's a challenge for me, all the distractions of, of social media and being wired, because in any second, I can communicate with lots of people, right? Right. Right, so you pull to do it. So uh, first, they, they need to really be grounded in the Father's love more intentionally because so many come from broken homes, because there's such a spirit of fatherlessness and it's something to really pursue. To, to, uh, for some, like I went through that very short period of a couple of years of struggling with feeling condemned and not doing enough. But really before that and ever since, I, did, I know the love of the Father. And I remember talking to David Wilkerson once, and I said, I never feel condemned. He goes, yeah, but most aren't like that. Mm. Like, I know, I know. So uh, don't take it for granted. Even some people raised in good homes there's still like a fatherlessness over the generation. Because if you have that, you'll make it. Because every one of us is going to fall short somehow. I don't mean we're going to go out and commit adultery or kill somebody. But we're going to disappoint the Lord and ourselves one way or another mm. over the years. If you know the Father's love, you, you, you bounce back much mm. more easily. And you know, with all the depression, suicide, anxiety, much massively higher rates on this generation than previous ones, first... Make that a strong, strong foundation. Go out of your way. If you have to read books, if you have to 
receive ministry, if you have to pray into it intentionally, that everything starts there. Then secondly, you really have to be vigilant because everything is so connected now. Mm. You've got to really be vigilant like no other generation in history when it comes to porn. It's just it's everywhere. Uh, in my worst days as a heroin shooting rebel, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't have free access when I was 16. Mm. You know, I, I just didn't have it, right? And, and stuff that an eight-year-old can access, I didn't even know existed back then. Wow. Uh, the same thing with the distractions of social media and all of that and posting and you got to learn to focus. Uh, the college professors have said that they can't get a student to read through a book anymore. You know, so if, if everything, you know, it's one reason I try not to preach out of my phone, you know, using that for, as a Bible, take a physical Bible with me, because otherwise it's like, oh, their text just came in or, oh, mm -hmm. there's a, oh, look at this going on. Yeah. So you've got to really be vigilant to learn to focus. And, and I don't say it in a condescending way. Uh, I know I struggle with that. Mm. And, I, and I wasn't raised in the same way, just with like a cell phone as an appendage of your body, you yeah. know? So grounded in the Father's love, really work hard to be focused and, and not to be pulled by these other things because they're out there uh, on an extraordinary level. And then be sure not to find your value based on how many likes you have or how, who, who rejects you or whatever or what reach you have. That well, can be very, very deceptive and, and very, very superficial. So true. And, and then uh, the third thing I would say is to recognize that the harvest is extraordinarily ripe with young people. Okay. That as much as Gen Z has a much higher percentage of atheists than previous American generations, and massively higher percentage identifying as some of the LGBTQ plus spectrum, and so many have dropped out of church, and others identify as religious nuns, you know, N-O-N-E-S, mm -hmm. or duns, you know, once, once yeah. done, out of here. The fact is, they're, they're a hurting generation. Again, I don't say that in a demeaning way, but when you look at rates of depression, when you look at rates of, of anxiety and fear, loneliness, isolation, uh, the, the access to everybody has just made us more lonely. So if we come with hope and life, uh, there's an audience. And then lastly, don't try to prove how relevant and woke you are. You're not going to win the world by becoming like the world. You're going to win the world by becoming like Jesus. Yeah. So you're going to be rejected. You're going to be misunderstood. Yeah, talk about that. What kind of courage are they going to have? When you look at the, the future and maybe the state of society or what people will think about Christians or people that hold to the Bible, I mean, you, you're not a stranger to <laughs> conflict and uh, cancel culture. What What is the type of, I don't, how do people deal with that, develop courage to stand so up? Obviously, really meditate on the relevant scriptures that we will be hated, we will re be rejected, we should rejoice that it's for the Lord. Look at how others have suffered. Uh, read books about missionaries and martyrs. Read books hmm. about people who have really suffered for the faith. To this moment, uh, one, of the, one of our missionaries in uh, Nigeria, a woman in her 60s, doing an amazing work with the poorest of the poor and pretty close to Boko Haram in Nigeria, uh, she sends an urgent email out, the husband of one of her friends, a Nigerian woman, a husband has just been kidnapped by terrorists. They're demanding a ransom and they're trying to negotiate to get him back. And a couple of days later, she says, praise God, he's back, only with a gash on his head and missing a few fingers, praise God. So this was a win for them. Only wow. a gash on his head a and missing a few, yeah, a few fingers, exactly. So uh, drink that in yeah. until it becomes real. Uh, the whole idea of, of uh, you know, well, we're worried about losing friends on Facebook. Believers are losing their heads around the world. Let's, let's get a right perspective here. Kind of wow. like a slap in the face. Like, wake up. Yeah. Quit being a baby. Uh, and, and then, third thing is, to, to, so you meditate on scriptures about this. You, you look at what believers are really suffering in other parts of the world uh, and in history. And, and then you, you understand it's not, it's not about me. This is about the gospel. Hmm. In other words, this person was my friend until they found out what I believed. 
this person really enjoyed my company until they found out my convictions. Yeah. So it's not because they find me to be a jerk. This is about the Lord. And therefore, my concern is their well-being. Now everything shifted. I feel bad for them because they don't know Jesus. Hmm. And it's my honor to go outside the camp where Jesus is. If they're maligning him, I want to be with him. Yeah. You hate him. I'm going to identify with him. Uh, and, and then it's, it's not about you. The other side of it is it's about the other person. So uh, in recent days, I've, I've quoted Thomas Sowell, who said that when you care about others, you tell them the truth. When you care about yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. Yeah. So it's just like you're a shy person, you're a quiet person, but there's a truck coming around the street and the people right. in the corner don't see it. Get out of the way! You scream at the top of your lungs because it's not about you. It's about them. Yeah. So you take these things in and then you realize, okay, the arrows, the attack, that's a good sign. That's a sign we're doing our job. Uh, hmm. Because if we were just like the world, John 15, 18, and following, the world would love you as its own. Yeah. That's what Jesus says. Matthew 10, 24, if the master of the house has been called Beelzebub, the devil himself, how much more are the members of his household? 2 Timothy 3, 12, all those who live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So for me, it's a good sign. For me, it's an encouraging sign that we're doing the right thing. And the defilement, the junk, that feeling of unclean that comes with it, it's like, that's just reproach for the Lord. Mm. That's just sharing in his sufferings. That's a sacred privilege. And I've, I've literally washed the feet of brothers that were on their way to go preach, and they knew they're going to suffer and they may die. And by the end of the meeting, they were jumping and, and rejoicing because mm. they know they get to suffer for Jesus. So wow. we, we got to change our perspective. Need some of that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, I, I want to end with a few questions about Brownsville. Yeah. Um, I mean, when you look at in the future, I'm sure that there are stories and things that happen in that moment. You're like, we need that again. Uh, maybe it's a different version, expression of it. But just talk about it. were there some just incredible stories where God broke your paradigm or was what it, was possible? Was it or my paradigm uh, based on the word? based on my study of revival history, based on the outpouring that came through me in 82, 83, when God woke me back out of, out of my, uh, my spiritual pride, uh, nothing surprised me in mm. that regard. Okay. But I was constantly overwhelmed by what God did. I was, it's, it's indescribable. All I can say is, when I'll sit down with grads, old friends who are part of Brownsville, we haven't seen each other in years, and we just start reminiscing. Within seconds, we're all weeping. It's not nostalgia. It's you remember what God did. You remember the intensity of his presence. You know, you think of the phenomenon of it, that the lines would form at 6 in the morning, day in, day out for years. Lines would form at 6 in the morning for the doors to open at 6 in the evening, for the service to start at 7. So people would get there 13 hours in the hot Florida sun or in the rain, wow. waiting to get in. Uh, unsafe people. Uh, and, and then the service would go about five hours a, a night, sometimes longer. And, and just that phenomenon. One woman that joined the church, that's how we heard her testimony, she got saved driving by the building. No thought of God in her mind at all. Drives by the building. Spirit falls in the car. She becomes deeply conscious of sin, begins weeping over her sins, gets born again in her car. The, the water baptisms where, where the power of God would just fall dramatically. Hmm. People we knew, you know, in control, calm, not emotional people. And they just start testifying. Next thing, they're weeping. Power of God falls on them, and they're out. We got to hmm. fish them out of the water. I remember the first night there, I said to Steve Hill, the evangelist, my friend, I said, they're coming out of the water dead, you know, dead to <laughs> sin. But literally, you carry them out because the power of God fell. When, when the Spirit would just sweep in over a meeting, and you're just yeah. on your face is weeping, or altar calls that would literally last two hours, and, and people just heads bowed, crying out. And, you know, individual scenes hard to forget you know we would have we got featured in major publications from the new york times to rolling stone magazine you know yeah. cnn covered things all kinds of stuff and and um so when that would happen often there'd be a photographer that would come in if it was a publication for the front cover or something because otherwise photography was not allowed during the services yeah so we'd announce there's a photographer one of the ushers would announce you know just 
don't be distracted. They're here officially. It's okay. So it was days before digital. So you're watching them snap, changing rolls of film, several dozen rolls, hundreds and hundreds of pictures. They're just snapping away. Steve finishes preaching as the altar call. I still remember the night the guy, the cameraman with camera on his chest comes running to, he's the first one, running to the altar to get right with God. And he's sobbing, sobbing at the altar. And he looks up and he sees all the people sobbing around and realizes, this is a great photo op. <laughs> so he grabs his camera, starts taking pictures. Then he's overcome, goes back to sobbing <laughs> alternately. I mean, we go out, we go on the field, places I've been to for years overseas or in America well, where God would move, but now it was the same as at Brownsville. They hadn't seen any of it. It just, boom, God breaking out, like in a meeting, suddenly, where I'm just out of the blue, you don't even know what happened. Just you've been preaching and ready to close the meeting, boom. Next thing, the power of God falling on people and young people weeping and, and you know, seeing little children overcome in intercession and yeah. just the way God moved, it was, it was extraordinary. Uh, you know, even things like the, the first semester at the school, one of the faculty members, real spiritual prophetic guy who's teaching on the tabernacle during an Old Testament survey class. And, and he said, you know, the, the presence of God was localized in the tabernacle. And one of the students said, isn't that kind of what's happening in Brownsville? And suddenly this faculty member, Bob Gladstone, found it hard to talk. It just was so, everything about thick presence. And next thing, kids in the class start screaming, the cloud the cloud of the Lord came into the classroom while he was teaching about the tabernacle. They start screaming. It's not like someone said, let's imagine this. Let's envision. It just yeah. happened. So these crazy things. You know, one guy comes walking out of a bar, um, uh, actively homosexual relationship, drug user. Uh, one of the students leads him to Jesus. He gets radically saved. He's been on the mission field now probably over 25 years and an orphanage and all this just we saw wow. it day and night for more than four years it was what indescribable it, for people that are like i need to contend for that to happen again what it, what is what does a lifestyle look like what would you call them to to say like this is what it looks like to contend for revival yeah it's it, it means dying a thousand deaths because you agonize you have to see the breakthrough. You fast, you cry out. I can't live another day without the breakthrough. It doesn't come. Hmm. And you have to get up the next day. But yeah. you remind yourself. Is that uh, something you can personally drum up or does that have to be a gift oh, from no, the no. Lord to put you, you it, can, a hunger that he puts in you? You can pursue you. the hunger. You can say, God, I'm not hungry. Yeah. I, I feel nothing. I don't have a burden. I know intellectually I should, but I don't. Would you deepen my burden? So ask him to help you to be hungry. Read things that help you get hungry. Watch things that help you get hungry. It's so good. Present that vision, right? Because what, what I'm confident is going to happen next is not one place, but, but thousands of places all around the world, all over America, where God's moving. So it's not just one place they're flocking to, like mm -hmm. Toronto or Pensacola, but rather all, all over the place. In fact, we're working on materials that will help pastors and leaders experience this for the first time, knowing what to do wow. when the floods come. But... When you go through that, because I've been through it many years of my life, the burden is so intense, I feel like I'm going to burst. I, I can't live without seeing the breakthrough. You may have it for the nation where you are. You may have it for a people group. or It's like you keep hitting a wall, I keep hitting a wall. But just remember, every prayer matters. Come on. Just, just like a contraction that a woman's having in labor. The, the delivery is getting closer. So every, every blow of that ax is making a difference. Uh, Amy Carmichael's spiritual mentor was driving with her, I guess, through Ireland before she had gone to be a missionary in India. And there were these guys, whatever kind of clubs, hammers they had, they were, they were smashing rock, breaking rock. So, you know, hit it, hit it, hit it. And then, boom, the thing finally breaks. So he asked her, which is the blow that, that breaks mm. the rock? And you'd think the last, and his no, was every blow, yeah. every blow. So I've learned to be encouraged by that. In other words, I've learned... To, to let the hunger be my encouragement. Because if God keeps birthing that thing in me, he's going to do it. So whereas yeah, in the earlier wow. years, there was that sense of frustration. When's it going to come? How long? Even though I can still agonize over the how long, as long as God keeps burdening me, 
I could be 102 years old. As, as long as he keeps burdening me, that means it's coming. It's coming. He's yeah. going to do this. So let the hunger that drives you, and that even frustrates you, encourage you. Uh, folks can watch a message I preached uh, at Brownsville on YouTube called Holy Desperation. Okay. And if you want to see what an altar call looked like there, normally Steve had music and there was a powerful appeal song. This night I had no music or anything as, as I gave the altar call. But you'll see the kind of response that we got. But the message is called Holy Desperation. Let the frustration move to desperation and, and let that drive you. And, and you will see the answer. You will see God move in you, through you, around hmm. you in ways that will take your breath away. Wow. And then just as a last question, what is it, what is it unto? I mean, you look at Brownsville, those four years, you know, what was, what's it unto? You look at Asbury and all the college students that are like, what, you know, what, you know, what came from that? What, what do we do with it now? Uh, you think about in the future, all these places, they're going to be start lighting up. What is that moment where the Lord shows up in power? What's the next step? What is it for? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. And one we need to keep before us on the one hand, why are you praying for revival? Never forget that. Well, because this Muslim community is totally unreached because people are bound and we're not seeing a breakthrough mm. because the church is asleep. You know, you're praying for it for a reason because when it comes, it comes with intensity and with unusual things, with controversy, and we often focus on the wrong stuff. Yeah. So we weren't praying for the revival for the revival itself as glorious as, as it is, but to see certain results impact change. So never forget that. Why were you praying for revival in the first place. Like, let's say you were, you know, you're agonized to, to see the sick healed and now revival comes and the power of God falls and people are encountering the Lord and falling under his power. That's wonderful, but you, didn't, you weren't praying for them to fall, but to be healed, mm. right? So remember that. And, and then ultimately everything one way or another has to issue in the repentance of the church and the harvest and the lost. So holiness and harvest. Everything ultimately has to issue in some great commission outcome. Come on. So okay. whatever's happening, that's why as soon as God called me to be part of the revival, he spoke to me about the need to equip and export. So we were already having Steve, the evangelist, constant emphasis on reaching the lost, reaching the lost, reaching the lost. So that was there. But we raised up a school to say, you've been touched, now go out, now go out, now go out. So it always has to issue forth in the birthing of ministries to the lost, to the poor, to the hurting. And, and to the growth of the church hmm. it always has to issue out in those things. And we could never lose sight of it. Hmm. So good. Well, thank you. This was a fascinating conversation we got to have. My joy. And for all of your uh, students, future, present, my app, Ask Dr. Brown Ministries, yes. ASKDR Brown, one word, Ask Dr. Brown Ministries, thousands of hours of free resources and the three R's of our ministry, revival in the church, gospel-based revolution in society, moral cultural revolution, and redemption in Israel. And we know ultimately that the, the key for the second and third hours is, is the first, revival in the church. Everything yeah. has to flow out of that. Wow, thank you. Okay, we'll go download that app. Thank you very much. You're very welcome.